Scientists against women's suffrage. Anti-feminist writing. Sir Almroth Edward Wright was a British bacteriologist and immunologist born in 1861. He's best known for his work developing an inoculation against typhoid, but he also wrote a book in 1913, The Unexpurgated Case Against Woman Suffrage. In it, he outlines women's disabilities, which mean that they should categorically not be given the vote. I'll summarise his arguments here, in his words, mostly. Chapter one, woman's disability in the matter of physical force. So Wright's opening gambit is that the primordial argument against giving woman the vote is that that vote would not represent physical force, which barely makes sense and reads as if every vote cast needs to be ratified with a bicep measurement or a demonstration of substantial core strength. He goes on to clarify that it is by physical force alone and by prestige that a nation protects itself against foreign interference, upholds its rule over subject populations and enforces its own laws. So, other countries would not be impressed by a country that believed that women had the physical strength to give them the right to vote, and more so that the internal equilibrium of the state itself would be compromised if millions of electors, meaning women, were allowed to vote without the authority of physical force. We'll come back to this. We come to chapter two, woman's disability in the matter of intellect. Here he goes on to list women's intellectual defects. Namely, that women look upon their minds not as an implement of the pursuit of truth, but as an instrument for providing her with creature comforts in the form of agreeable mental images. So, we're happier choosing soft furnishings and imagining kittens. He explains that women just don't have the capacity to understand the importance of, again, physical force, which is something he is quite fixated on, considering his own career choice as someone who works in a laboratory with a microscope. He wants to point out that woman is notoriously unadapted to tasks in which severe physical hardships have to be confronted. A quite ungifted man is a better instrument for dealing with the practical affairs of life than that of the intelligent woman. So we get it, right? Men, strong, women, not. But back to intellect. Wright talks about the suffragist theory that women are held back by preceding generations' lack of education, an idea that he considers to be congenial, not rational, and an example of how women literally think what they like. In fact, he diminishes the whole argument entirely by questioning whether educating women in line with men in the future would potentially retard him, he means men, over much by her lagging in the rear. The thought of future men's intellect being compromised by silly women trying to keep up with them is, according to Wright, a larger issue. Now we come to chapter three, woman's disability in the matter of public morality. So Wright comes to his third and final argument here, and it's a good one. Women have defective moral equipment. His argument is simple. Men are the intellectual caste, and as such their objective is to be mindful of his public obligations. In all times of crisis, he may be counted upon to apply the principles of communal morality which have been handed down to him in the race. By the race, he means specifically men. And he tells us about woman who is only loyal to those who are linked up to her by a bond of sexual affection or a community in blood, or failing this, by a relation of personal friendship. So, Women don't have it in them to see beyond their own doorstep or book club. But he goes on to add that women just don't really have it in them at all. They are entirely without a moral sense in the matter of executing a public trust such as voting or attaching herself to a political association. 
He clinches this with, in this matter, one would not be very far from the truth if one alleged that there are no good women, but only women who have lived under the influence of good men.